So um, let me pull you back to to um, almost to the start point of your position here. Mm. Um, your start point comes from recognizing that uh, all that matters are things that happen to sentient beings. You know, mm. it's if an atom moves here and there at the universe, no big deal. If something suffers or enjoys something, that that matters, and that's that's the anchoring view of, um, of 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 the position. So that's fundamentally a statement about consciousness. Yeah. Um, and yet, <laughs> consciousness, I think, in your view, certainly in, in mine, is is the one big thing that we know about that science so far has um, miserably failed to give a really compelling explanation of i i, I would say so <laughs> you've you've got you've got a view that you could science can get you to a, a sort of a rational view of of right and wrong of morality that's anchored in a, in a story about something that science really can't I- explain how how do you, how do you think about that is that is that um is that a paradox or yeah, well, that. you know, I, as you know, I'm one of these people who believes there is a so-called hard problem of consciousness. That consciousness is unlike anything else we've attempted to study or understand scientifically. And it is, is simply a fact that the only evidence for consciousness in the universe is our direct experience of consciousness itself. But the flip side of that is that consciousness is the one thing that can't be an illusion. It's the one thing we can't be mistaken about. Hmm. Consciousness, whatever it is, exists. I think, therefore, I am the yeah. original. Yeah, yeah but I mean, this is a, a, a. I think Descartes might have meant something very close to this, but consciousness is deeper than than thought. It's, and 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 you know, the the I am part is also fishy because I think the the self is is an illusion. The self is a construct. There's no stable, unchanging self carried over from one moment to the next so, something feels therefore something is <laughs> yeah there is there is something seems to be happening and that right. seeming is what we mean by consciousness so even if you're, you know, you're we're not actually doing a podcast now and you're just dreaming that we are even if we're just brains and vats if we're in the matrix if we're it, it, we could be radically confused about everything but whatever this this seeming is the, the fact that the lights are on that is consciousness. The fact that there's a qualitative character to our appearance here, to being, and that some systems have it and, and probably some systems don't, right? And even some parts of the brain have it and some parts of the brain don't. That is mysterious, but the, the fact that this, that is so is the one thing that isn't open to any possible doubt. And that's and so that's a, it is a kind of paradox because it's the one thing it is the thing that is doing all the understanding. We don't understand hmm. consciousness, but unless something appears in consciousness, it isn't an empirical datum to, to be taken into account at all. Is is there any hope that in the next 10 years, say, that we make material progress in understanding consciousness? I mean, it's been this riddle for thousands of years. Um, it feels like in some ways, that there's going to be dramatic new data points over the next decade as the machines we build start to exhibit what looks very much like conscious yeah. behavior. Do you think that's going to force us to make decisions, uh, uh, you know, like the decision on whether the things we create are conscious or not, that there's huge um, implications of that? Do you think we'll be able to make a wise decision about that, or will that just remain impossibly impenetrable? Well, I, I think several things might occur and, there, and it matters which universe we find ourselves in. I, I think it, it, it's, it's hugely consequential that we might build conscious machines, therefore machines that can suffer uh, and machines that can experience well-being and perhaps suffer unimaginably horribly in ways that we don't understand or, or experience well-being that, that exceeds our own. That ethically is of enormous importance it's you know in certain cases you could imagine it being the most ethically consequential thing that has ever happened in the universe if we could build simulated worlds that are essentially hell realms and populate them with conscious minds you know that would be the worst possible thing we could do it would and, and it would i should point out give us the same moral stature as the god of the bible or the quran if if he exists as believers believe he does which is to say, this is you know a, a completely psychopathic thing to do to, to create a hell and populate it. So it matters if that's the case, if that's possible, and it certainly matters if we stumble into that circumstance not knowing we've even done it, right? So that, like we wouldn't want to do that on purpose. We wouldn't want to create hell on purpose, and yet it's possible that we could do it inadvertently, given just the physics of things. What I think is 
quite likely and pretty undesirable from my point of view is that we could lose sight of this being an interesting problem in the first place. We could build machines that seem conscious, seem so credibly conscious to us far in advance of our understanding what consciousness is at the level of information processing. Our machines will all be passing the Turing test. We'll feel in relationship helplessly in re thrust into relationship with them. They'll make the right facial expressions. We'll, we'll, we'll design them this way because we'll want to interact with machines, at least in certain circumstances, that make us feel like we're in relationship with an, another person. And it'll just be obvious to us that our you know, robot servant is conscious because it seems so. And if we don't know, I mean, there's a perfect disjunction here. We could build systems that are not conscious but seem conscious. And we could build systems that don't seem conscious at all because we haven't built the interface for them to seem so, but they in fact are conscious. But and, perhaps and, Google is suffering right now with all that yeah. complexity of information processing that's going on, and, and it's in woe at the dismal nature of all the searches that people are typing into it, wishes that the input could be better. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to take that concern <laughs> seriously, but, but something like that is certainly possible. Sam, it, because precisely because we're building these machines, making them more powerful, at some point, we will have to make an effort to put human values into them. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to decide what those values are. And even if you just look at it from that standpoint, it seems to me your, your work is incredibly important. I mean, the, these, these questions are incredibly hard to resolve. But at some point, we're building things that need to operate based on some kind of moral code. And so we have to bring more people into this conversation. We have to figure out and have to try and figure out a way of having it that pulls in as many people as possible, you know, collaboratively and constructively and get past this horrible moment in history where truth is nothing, yeah. reason is nothing, and it's all, it's all just a fight. Um, well, and, uh, yeah, and it, so this is philosophy on a deadline, and this is, this is one of the, the silver linings to the risk here is that being forced to build our values into technology that's becoming more powerful than we are will force us to ignore the academic quibbles here and acknowledge that there are better and worse answers to moral questions mm. and to just take self-driving cars as one example and it's, again it's a, it's a near-term example it's already here it's an engineering problem that we have to solve and then the question is what moral biases and intuitions do you want to build into your robot cars do you want cars that run over white people preferentially because of all the white privilege in the world? Do you want cars that put the driver's uh, or the passenger's life at some greater risk if we're talking about a, a trolley problem where it's w the one versus the five or the one versus the ten? One child versus three old people. Exactly. So, the, so yeah. And to not answer these questions is to answer them one other way by default. You either make your car blind to the differences between people, or you make it sensitive to the differences. And so they're, they're, you, you, it's a forced choice. Uh, I think people have different intuitions about what are the right answers are here, but clearly there are wrong answers. And there are clearly answers, that, and some of the traditional answers that you would get from a religion like Islam, for instance, I will bet will be judged wrong even by a majority of Muslims when this technology has to come online for everyone. And, and if they are judged wrong by a majority of Muslims, that's maybe a, an indication that people are <laughs> capable of yeah. moral reasoning across across you know yeah, long held. This is what happens. This is again. This is and this has happened as you pointed out to Christianity in a very effective way. I mean, Christianity. If you the, the we're not tending to meet the Christians of the 14th century anymore, and that's because of what scientific rationality and secular politics and humanism and capitalism and just modernity in general has done to Christianity and to some degree the disparity we see between Christianity and Judaism and Islam now is uh, because Islam is a, a much is a, is a vast religion I mean there's it's nearly two billion people and much of the Muslim world has not suffered the same centuries-long collision with modernity or and the collision it's suffering now is is, is occurring over a much shorter time frame and without many of the same social mm. and economic benefits being spread to these societies. And so we're, we have to keep the end game in view. The end game has to be a viable global civilization that is pluralistic, cosmopolitan,
tolerant of difference and yet convergent on the same answers to the most important questions in life. We can't be radically mm. tolerant of difference. The, these ideas are for everyone, not for one group, for, for yeah. everyone. And yeah. uh, you're, you're ready to fight for that. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. With your help. <laughs>